Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Graham. I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Metaphysic. And what we specialize in is photorealistic AI-generated content. So what that means is that we train algorithms with data, and that may be around somebody's face or an environment or costumes, anything like that. And we use the algorithms to create content that looks exactly like the real world. And so we're very lucky today. Um, we've got a couple of things coming up, a little bit of a live demo, but also we're just in the midst of um, launching today one of our new products, which is actually a data platform. So I'm going to touch more on that later. It helps people own and control their own data if they want to create an AI-generated photorealistic version of themselves, which is obviously more and more important in terms of what's happening in industry and film and in, ent and in entertainment. But before we get there, um, I think we'll just kick off with a little bit of a live demo. So I'm standing up here on stage, um, and actually I have a model of my face on top of my face the whole time. So the me that you are looking at is AI generated, and you can see when I put my hand in front of my face, it kind of like blinks on and off. Uh, this is an AI generated model of face swap trained on data from my face. Um, on top of me, and that's why it looks exactly kind of realistic. Um, it's not particularly interesting, um, apart from the artifice of what you're looking at is actually an AI version of me on top of my performance. Um, but if I invite Jordan up here to experiment, we can see what it might look like uh, on both of us at the same time. Now, Jordan has glasses on. We'll take those off. So, um, <laughs> Jordan, in, in real life, you can't see yet, but she doesn't have a teenage beard. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it's kind of, it's, you notice the microphone, it sees the microphone and it's trying to remove that from the, the model. But, um, yeah, it's a, a little bit strange, but that's what it looks like. And it, it will lock onto anybody's face. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we have similar face shapes, so that's um, kind of a good mix. But um, uh, that's a great example of um, kind of this technology that we're talking about. Sorry, I'll, I'll let you, oh, <laughs> let you go you. unless you want to um, <laughs> hang out in the awkward position of having my face. Um, this is a great example of technology that we use on production on films. So it is a live real-time deep fake. That feed is coming directly from the camera and it is running through a GPU in one of our machines just behind me. Um, and that GPU is doing inference live and in real time at about 40 frames a second. And it can do that over multiple people at one time. So uh, what you get there and what we have done in production are examples where you can have somebody on set performing and they can in live real time see the photorealistic perfect version of their de-aged self, their younger self, on top of their performance, and they can change their performance to act more young um, and adjust to that kind of VFX, which normally takes months and months um, and a large amount of money to actually apply to their faces after the fact during a big feature film, a Hollywood movie kind of thing. So that's quite an interesting development and really testament to the speed and advancement of generative AI algorithms um, coupled with big GPUs and sophisticated data sets uh, that we deploy uh, in production all the time, and a great indication of where the technology is moving. So it was a um, huge surprise to me that last year I came fourth on America's Got Talent. Um, I started my career as a lawyer and then moved into technology companies, and the idea of being on America's Got Talent is um, the furthest thing from what I could imagine, the direction that my life would go. But we worked with AGT, and they wanted to do interesting things with creating new performances. So. During that season, season 17 last year, we recreated Simon Cowell singing songs, um, Terry Crews and Howie Mandel singing opera, and then in the grand finale, we brought Elvis back to life. And what you see there is a totally synthetic version of Elvis performing live on stage, um, where the body performance is provided by a wonderful um, Elvis impersonator, uh, and he's doing the dance moves, etc but the face of the body and then also the voice has been adjusted with AI to achieve that kind of very realistic feeling Elvis version that you saw there on stage. In that performance, we had little cameos from Sofia Vergara and also Heidi Klum. Um, so that's an example of entertainment. You can bring people back to life. You can create a photorealistic immersive version of people's performance. Um, and you may be familiar with this being in London with some of the ABBA Voyage footage and stuff during that show, which our team also um, had a part in doing. 
So let's go in here. Um, before I click on this video, moving away from you know, the things that we can do with this technology, I also want to touch on what's important to us as a company, to me. Uh, I think that it's very, very important. If we're going to be able to create realistic versions of people, um, realistic versions of events with AI, then we need to empower regular people to be in control of their AI self, to be in control of their data that is used to create and train the AI algorithms. I think that that is one of the most important things that we can do for society because ultimately, and this is the example that I think of a lot, when my kids are in school, they're in history class, they're going to be reading about, uh, you know, when we're in history class, we've read about some kind of historical event, it's a paragraph on a page and we think about it. They're going to be reliving those historical events because generative AI will be used to create immersive versions of those events, those real world events. Um, and people will be able to consume them uh, and move around them or play them like a game and learn history, learn our history, what we care about, what we value as a society from that kind of really, really rich content. It's a much better experience than reading a paragraph. The question is, who controls the data that trains those algorithms um, about uh, to, to create those historical events? Whoever controls that data has a tremendous franchise over what we value, um, our knowledge. It's the vast repository of everything that we care about as humans, our society, our history, who we are. And this, on a micro level for every one of us, is the same for our faces and our voice. We should all care about tightly controlling and not allowing other people to have access to, freely, versions of uh, our data to make a version of our face or our likeness where they could have us say or do anything. So to do the, uh, like move in that direction, uh, a couple of months ago I created an AI version of myself, like a character of myself. It looks exactly like me. You're going to see it in one second. Um, and I applied for registration with the US Copyright Office. Here is the AI realistic version of myself. Even if the appearance of this AI representation of myself may change cosmetically, or if I change my hair or add creative features, my intention is to create this AI version of myself that embodies the essence of who I am as a person under any circumstance. And so the point here is that I am trying to grab property rights in this AI version, this AI character of myself. You can't copyright, you don't have intellectual property in the sound of your voice or how you look. But if you do have intellectual property in the AI version of how you look or your AI voice, then maybe you can stop people creating unauthorized deepfakes who are trying to infringe on your registered copyright. That's the goal, to provide remedies for people to get effective takedowns for unauthorized deepfakes which are posted on social platforms, etc. And I think that that's a really important thing that everybody should do. So, you know, we've just launched today Metaphysic Pro, um, which is a profile, a, a platform to help people store, manage, and capture their own biometric data. Um, movie stars, sports people, people with high value IP obviously have a big interest in this. They want to own that data for themselves. They don't want studios or agents, etc., to own that data. And so we've built that platform. Uh, and you can also go through that and in an automated way create the AI version of yourself and copyright it. And you can see there an example of you know, a data set that I've created on my part of a platform. Um, and ultimately, these data sets are very detailed. You know, it, they boil down to a lot of images or a lot of recordings of your voice. And that's really important data because it lasts forever. So you can capture it today, just like you can capture data from your kid's first birthday or your wedding. And you can hold that data today. And in the future, with the advancement of generative AI, we'll be able to recreate those events with the fidelity of reality. So you can re-experience them, share them with your family, etc. I think that the future of what we consume as content is largely going to be dominated by generative AI output, generative AI pixels. Um, and a lot of it is going to be built from data from our real lives. So my message for everybody is that we need to care about the data from our face, from our voice, what makes us uniquely human. We need to care about the data that represents our life experiences. This should belong to us. Above all, we should look after it. And that's what we're trying to enable at Metaphysic. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Do you want to pass the clicker to Roman? Roman? Thank you, Tom. I think. Hi, everyone. I'm Romain from Dark Matters. Let's see how that works. 
So I'll start with talking a tiny bit about myself. Um, I started actually putting content in front of users in the media server industry, mostly for theme park installation, using projectors, LED screens, these kind of things. And then moved to the movie industry where we started putting content in front of cameras to reproduce worlds, um, be it real worlds, be it impossible worlds, all these kind of things. And a few years ago, we decided that it was the right time for real-time technologies to come together and be actually used in many, many production. So we started a company called Dark Matters, which is uh, located south of Paris, and you will see that this is kind of a big one. There is a bit of real-time all over the place. We're thinking about real-time engines that we use, be it on set, be it for the motion capture, or be it for the pre-visualization. So we are on pretty much every stage of, of production, from prep to the last day of shooting. One of the things we need the most is content. Um, we, we need content to visualize what we're going to do in the motion capture stage. We need content to visualize on set. We need to replicate the real world. We need to create new worlds. On how do we get this content together? The good thing about virtual production, we've been talking about it for, I don't know, five, six years now, is that it's finally becoming kind of mainstream. Like producers understand the benefits of it, all departments come together and pull us early in the process. So I think we can say now that virtual production is just production. So let's focus a tiny bit on the big LED screens, you know, these things that have been used all over the place. What do we use them for? Sometimes there are places, I'm thinking the Versailles Castle in France, for example, where you want to shoot, but you can go there for one day a week, which will never be enough to shoot a full movie, of course. So we tend to recreate the real world, be it interiors, horizon, being roads for vehicles, etc., etc. One of the common things we have for vehicles as well is that uh, when you have a stunt crew or you need to synchronize multiple vehicles, you will um, do the shooting outside because you know, it's still fun to break some cars on the road. But then for the main lines, for the main sequences with the main characters, we tend to bring them back in the safety of the studio to be able to do it again and again and be really confident this is going to happen on schedule. Of course, there is impossible locations. I think it's all started with that. Uh, we, we've talked about these LED volumes on, you know, big uh, AAA. I think the Mandalorian was one of the, the ones that during COVID made the most marketing outside of it. But again, my, my thinking is that we tend to reproduce the real world more and more. And this is what we actually need the most in production. There is nothing we can do without the real world. Every time we need physical sets before doing the virtual ones. Um, again, I'm coming to the content. We have different types of content. We are doing 2D plates. You know, when you want to do a car shoot, you just go on location, film on the road, all these kind of things. Uh, we have 2.5D, which is a bit of a strange one because you use this spherical content that you move depending on the angle or axis you want in camera. And of course, the 3D con content. Um, one thing we've been using more and more is actually abstract content, something that goes beyond reality just to make some kind of effect in camera. So the key challenges we face nowadays, so again, it's about optimizing for real time, it's about creating this content regarding the right specification, and this is where the knowledge actually is taking time to spread. But also, I think this is um, where the future of what we do is. How do we create content nowadays? It's a basic CG pipeline, be it uh, in Unreal Engine or Unity or any kind of real-time render engine that is close to the game industry, actually. Um, but I think it's just the first step. The other side is capturing reality, pun intended. You know, we go on film things, we use photogrammetry, we use LiDARs, we use all this kind of tech again, but this is still taking a lot of time, but we have new things coming on. We have things like the neural radiance field, things like Gaussian splatter that will speed up this process and give us the capability to recreate any kind of environment with a really small team quickly in the studio. So there, there is this 
set, where you have your physical things going on. Then you have your extension with the LED wall, and then you want to extend that again. That's something we do a bit in filmmaking, but we do a lot in broadcast. I think pretty much everyone knows has seen a Super Bowl or anything where you have like 3D content right in the middle of what's been shown. So all these tools are based on real-time technologies. Finally, we can see things right through the camera. Finally, we can iterate super quickly. I think it, they paved the way for the next generation, which will be real-time generated content. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, Elizabeth, over <laughs> to you. Um, hi, I'm Elizabeth Fallow. I'm going to see if I can work this quicker. And I'll be really, really quick. Um, I am from Accenture Song. I am the augmented reality uh, director. I didn't realize how big this screen was going to look like. So if someone can take a picture of this and post it on LinkedIn for me and try to start a rumor that I'm sort of some sort of dark orb overlord, I would be very, very grateful. <laughs> this is too big. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be very quick because I think we've got 18 minutes left. Yeah, so basically we're working on spatial computing, generative AI, Web3, and blockchain. And, you know, the, I'm actually going to leave you on this slide. If you're interested in seeing more of the work, um, hit me up on LinkedIn or you can hit me up on Instagram. It's just at Valo, my last name. We can talk all about amplifying identity, interactive, accessible, transportive, larger than life, and most importantly, Im um, immersible. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, that's wonderful and very brief. Thank you. Um, now, I've, I've been so inspired being here for the last two or three days. Um, we've heard so much about so many incredible tools and new technologies, new toys for storytellers to play with and everyone to play with. Um, my work day to day is about helping storytellers and filmmakers get into the industry and build their careers. So I'm super invested in where this is all going. Um, a lot of the conversation has been about making film production you know, better, faster, more efficient, cheaper. But it feels to me like some of these technologies, it's not just about doing what we already do faster. This is going to open up whole new areas of storytelling and uh, story consumption. Where do you, I'm going to ask all of you this, but I'm just curious to know, where do you see it going? I'm going to start with Tom, because you're at the end. I don't know if you... Sure. Yeah. Um, so I think that there is a big change in how you can create content with generative AI. Um, it is certainly more efficient. Um, for instance, with faces and bodies, you can do things that you can't do with traditional VFX. So I think that, you know, on a micro scale, we will see more movies with younger versions of people, with people who have deceased. Um, and then eventually we will see content, uh, and by, when I say eventually, I mean like very soon, um, where regular people are featured inside content and that content is tailored directly to them. So you might log into Disney Plus with your data and ask to be put inside a Star Wars film and one of the characters would be you and it streams back to you. Um, there are myriad possibilities because the ability to create that content on the fly with generative AI is not just cheaper, but it's faster towards real time um, and it's cost effective, whereas traditional VFX is not something that is uh, cost effective. And I'm just curious about, just to pick you up on that, um, the idea of having yourself in a film. Mm. Do you think that that's near future? How far away do you think that might be? Uh, next week. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that realistically, the technology will go faster than companies' ability to solve the rights problems and the practical problems of doing that. Yeah. Um, I think that it'll only be 12 to 18 months before generative AI video amateurs are doing that anyway. Right. Super interesting. Elizabeth, I'm keen to know what you think of this. Yeah, I have a lot of um, thoughts about this, and particularly since I come from a background of building out the augmented and virtual reality platforms for at Meta. So uh, when you're working at a basically social media platform that's moving into a more narrative and an immersive space, it, the, the, the hero of every film is the user. Um, and I think that it's a more um, global phenomenon to be sort of the main character, you know, main character syndrome. Um, and it opens up a really interesting opportunity because uh, the, the sort of paradigm of entertainment reaching an audience hasn't changed much when it's come to cinema. 
right? Um, it's hugely changed when it's come to gaming, right? We get deeper and deeper into these worlds. And exactly to your point, now we're able to have Gen AI that's a bit more responsive. The world can be endless. Um, it can be very personal to you. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we're very cautious about as we're building some of these backend systems, though, is making sure we don't replace people with uh, you know, non-playing characters and things like that, or taking, taking jobs away from real humans. Mm -hmm. um, so on the one hand, it's very exciting to think about how the nature of storytelling, and particularly the nature of cinema, you know, on topic, mm -hmm. could be something that involves the audience as well. Mm -hmm. Nothing like that has really existed since campfire or you know theater in the round or horrible dinner theater or something like that right like interactive yeah. entertainment has not been cinematic yet so i'm super excited about that but then also thinking very cautiously about making sure that we're not taking work away from real talent and replacing folks who actually can give us the joy of their craft Okay. Yeah, I'm being really pragmatic here. Um, f to me, everything that saves on the budget and saves on the schedule actually frees creativity. That gives you more space for creativity. So anything that is controlling your environment, generating content faster, be it, uh, I don't think anything is going to replace VFX or traditional crew. It's, it's, it's not the point here. It's that we, we change the way we are working to be more efficient, more iterative for the sake of creativity. Mm -hmm. And what do you think it means when, you know, this, is, this technology and these tools open up effects and technology that previously was the preserve of the very, very sort of top end of the industry? So we already are in an, area, in an era where we have, you know, YouTube and TikTok and people can self... Uh, can, everybody has a movie studio in their phone. <laughs> um, where does it go when suddenly the content that everybody's... Like the user-generated content is suddenly rivaling movie studios in terms of what it looks like? Um, what do you see happening then in terms of what will the professional industry do to raise the game? Or how will we navigate it? Or oh, there's going to be so much. We're already in an abundance of content. What does it mean for... <laughs> Is that one for me? Yeah, you can find yeah. it. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a very difficult area to, to navigate because at the end of the day, it's if you're in a capitalist economy, even when it comes to the value of creativity, mm -hmm. when there's a glut of creativity at a very high quality, um, the price will go down. And that's where I start to worry about efficiency, right? So if, if we're talking about um, having a million talented creators that all get a dollar, right, as opposed to one talented creator who gets a million dollars, then we end up in sort of, you know, a race to the bottom, actually, in terms of uh, how, much, how much a good idea should cost. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's tricky. I mean, I, first of all, I think that we're a long way away from uh, someone at home with an iPhone being able to create great cinema. Yeah. You know, they can make cinema of their own kind, but there is still value to, to big production. Mm -hmm. um, what I do worry about, though, is sacrificing craft for, for cost whenever possible, right? Which is where I think that some regulation of the use of AI is actually super important mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, this is about human joy and human creativity um, and not about how to make something the cheapest and fastest that we can. Sure. If, I, if I may add something on that, um, you can't create a story on your own unless you're like this kind of crazy genius, which I never met, I wish I had. You need some people that are dedicated to writing the script, you know, building the entire story, then people dedicated to the lighting of it, to the actual photography of it, etc., etc. So in that sense, you will always need a crew, you will always need many, many people, even if you could do it with your iPhone, it's not the same kind of things you're going to build in the end. That's true. Um, Tom, I'm keen to come to you here because uh, Metaphysic, you are working on Metaphysic Pro, as you've discussed already. You're also working with movie studios and making, in getting involved in films. What do you see happening and where do you see the sort of journey of all of this taking the professional industry? So I think that um, there are many things happening here. One of those is that content creation is going to become cheaper because some budgets, like very, very large VFX budgets, are just it's just not going to cost that much to do those effects. Mm -hmm. That, I think, will lead to more things being created because studios, etc., will spend the same money on more creativity, more, more stories, etc. That may lead to more jobs, etc., more different types of jobs. Some things will certainly be reduced. There is no doubt that that will happen, as it will happen in all different industries as generative AI touches 
all parts of our lives. Um, I think that well, the thing that I'm excited about is relevant content, you know, for regular people. There is so much content on Netflix and everywhere else, but I don't want to watch any of it. You know, it's just not interesting to me. Mm. A lot of content is a compromise to reach a broad audience. If you can make content more cost effectively, you can make multiple versions of it. You can make content that appeals to smaller and smaller audiences. Mm. So I think there will be much more content, but then we as individuals will have more that we want to watch. And then it will come to a point where you know, it's content about our lives or it involves our actual experiences or features us and our friends. Mm. And that may feel a little bit more like gaming. If you go into a gaming environment and you're gaming with your friends, you're doing that experience with them. Um, so having the cinematic version of that or the storyline version of that where you are interwoven into it is really, really interesting to me. Mm. Um, and I think that that creates value for regular people where there is more relevant content for them and gives everybody who creates content different ways to monetize. I think, you know, having, creating content with AI, I think there is a capricious, you know, genius of human performance that is very, very hard to pull out of the AI today. People say, you know, oh, this script is great, etc., but it's not. It takes thousands of iterations and someone really rewriting a script which is generated by generative AI today. Maybe in a few years it will be much, much better. Mm -hmm. But there is something new about what humans can do, and humans can do that effectively even if generative AI can do that. So I think that storytellers, people who own IP that has built-in audiences, mm -hmm. um, will be very, very relevant as we can make more content that's more relevant, more cost-effectively. Uh, so I think there's a lot of content coming, um, but there will be changes just like the entire industrial revolution which is going to touch our society. Yeah. Elizabeth, I see you nodding. Do you have something to add here? Well, I just wonder, so, so it's an interesting industrial revolution that we're having because it's going to take out the younger generation, I believe, actually. So in the past, it was the craftsmen and the people who made things with their hands. Mm -hmm. And for, at this level, it's going to be start, it's early entry jobs, right? Yes. Beginning writers, like all of the sort of grunt work that's slightly less skilled mm -hmm. can now be done by these robots that we can control and stuff like that. So it's, it's, uh, it's troubling, right? Because culture rises from the youth often, yes. you know? So I'm wondering if we're going to have, what, is, what was it called? Like the Balearic Jihad from Dune, the anti-computerization, anti right? right. It, was, it becomes super uncool and counterculture to use computers at all right. because it took my job, yeah, right? right? So I'm really interested to see what happens, actually. Um, but also, I would say that the younger generations generally are the first to get their hands on these tools and understand how to play with them and subvert things. But they don't really. care about them, not yeah. in the same way. Right. You know? I think that, that most you know, Gen Zers and even Gen, gen uh, Alphas, they, they see the, the phone as sort of an, an, you know, a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Like, I can, make some, I can make connections here, and I can make some money on here, but I don't love it. Right. Right? The way millennials and Gen X do, because it was new to us. It was like candy. Yes. But uh, I think it's going to be interesting. Now. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I'm conscious of time. Um, yeah. Cog X has a key question this year, which is, how do we get the next 10 years right? I'm curious to know, and this is one for all of you, uh, what do you see happening over the next 10 years, and how do you see this progressing? Do you think that the, um, what AI has done for the industry is going to continue accelerating at the rate it has done recently? Do you think it might plateau soon and even out slightly? Or, uh, Roman, let's start with you. Yeah, I think there's going to be a cycle, you know, at some point we're going to try and build everything based on AI or machine learning, etc., etc. And the story of the human civilization tells you that when you reach this kind of thing, then there is a throwback. We come back to the old way of doing things. Um, then you find balance. So I, hopefully we're going to find balance in the next 10 years. Okay, Elizabeth, any thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it's, we could talk about how there's going to be a big change, probably a very, a very tumultuous change. But I think that in the, for the short term, the takeaway I would say would be to rethink the narrative arc, mm -hmm. to think about actually involving your audience in, in the content that you're creating. Use all the tools that are available to us now and then have some really, really strong meditative thoughts about what's right to use it for and what's not. <laughs> Thank you. Tom. Yes, I think that 10 years is a very long horizon for us to talk about in terms of, say, generative AI and its impact on the yeah. entertainment industry. Um, <clears throat> there are strikes today from the last 10 years of technical change in terms of platforms and remuneration. 
Um, and those strikes didn't pop up because of AI, um, but now we have changes to production, um, which I believe will accelerate over time. Um, and I don't see that slowing in any way um, because of what's happening e economically um, in the markets. Uh, I think that studios are trying to save money um, and I don't see that changing even in the next 10 years from a macroeconomic point of view. Um, so I think that this trend will continue. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of minutes left and I'm just conscious you have a launch today. Um, you've mentioned Metaphysic Pro already, um, and obviously the, the key sort of, or the, the primary um, use you've, you've mentioned for it is people protecting them, their selves and their rights, but is it something that everybody can, might use, and do you see that being something that might be, become commonplace for people to be uh, copywriting themselves, their avatars? Yeah, no, beyond the copyright thing, I think that building this portfolio of your own digital assets that you own, you don't kind of give them to a large tech platform through terms of service, you fundamentally own them. Um, in the same way that you fundamentally own and control your, your movement through reality, your life, your body, what you say and what you do. Um, I think that'll be an important theme. It will be heavily regulated by governments because governments don't want to give a franchise over identity and recreating a real version of people to technology companies, that won't happen. Um, but law and regulation takes a long time to catch up with technological change, which has happened so swiftly. Mm -hmm. So I think that that change will develop over the next 10 to 20 years. And that's why we use kind of existing legal paradigms like copyright law to try to empower regular people to grab whatever rights they can today mm -hmm. and find remedies for, in this case, unauthorized deep fakes posted on the internet. And if this is something that people in the audience today are interested in, how do they get involved? Is it all the information out now? Or? Yes, so on our website, metaphysic.ai. Okay, perfect, thank you. Are you guys going to copyright your digital avatars? Uh, maybe tonight. <laughs> Elizabeth, this feels quite you. Is that something that you... I just hope to? that she's not cooler than I am. That's the thing. <laughs> like, if my avatar gets to be more popular than I am, then it's going to be trouble. So. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, um, well... If I may add something, sure. um, I think we've been very focused on the way the content is generated, but it's been now something like five or seven years that I see the, the boundaries in between different mediums blurring. You know, the boundary between video game and the movie industry, etc., etc. The way we produce the content on the pipeline to produce it is getting closer and closer every day. So just to come back to your question, what's going to happen in 10 years? Maybe this is going to merge, but then it has to move apart. Again, otherwise we're all going to be watching exactly the same thing, having the same experience, etc., etc. Right. So actually, I'm yeah, a bit interested in what's, what's going to happen. Yes. Um, and l last, uh, last question for you all. Is there anything that you think people who are interested in getting into this space should be thinking about or learning? Or, you know, for, um, I'm particularly conscious of the next generation coming in. What tools do they need? What skills do they need? And are we training the, enough of the right people? Yeah, don't be afraid of it, first of all. That's the thing. I think that there's, there's uh, so, much, so much sort of clickbait and press and stuff like that. And also, if you work in the industry already, you might have some very strong opinions around you on whether this is good or bad, right? But I think try it, first of all, mm -hmm. because a strong creative um, mind driving some of this technology produces incredible results. So don't be scared, first of all. <laughs> um, but then second of all, think about... Um, the limitlessness of adding something like quantum computing behind some of these engines as well, which I think could actually create entirely new formats that we've never even thought of. So just think big. Excellent advice. Tom, any final? I think young people have got it under control. I think we should be asking them what, um, <laughs> what are they doing with it, really. That's, um, right. I find that uh, many young people integrate things so quickly and seamlessly into their regular lives. It just becomes a chattel you know, a feature of their life rather than something new and shiny. So um, I look forward to seeing what, what people do with it. Thank you. Rama, yeah, I, words? I'm thinking the same. Don't, don't be afraid of it. Just experience with it. You know, it's just like back in the day when we were starting like uh, computer programming, you were creating something out of nothing. Um, now it's become pretty quick and it's the same idea with those tools. Just play with it and create and make it your own. That's excellent. We are just on time. So um, if you would all please thank me, uh, join me in thanking our panel for joining us today. Um, I can't wait to see what happens next. Thanks. All good.